any uh, event or conference of this nature, it's a standard cliche to say our next guest needs no introduction. But in this particular case, I mean, it's probably the reason why this cliche was invented in the first place. And there's absolutely no way I will be able to do adequate justice at introducing someone of this stature. So we've done the next best thing, and we've outsourced this task to someone who is an inspirational leader and pioneer herself. So please put your hands together for Shobha Moni, and who will be moderating this fireside chat with Ms. Indra Nui. For those of you who don't know Shobha, and I'm totally judging you right now, uh, she is an I am Bangalore class of, class of 1985. Uh, she's a founder partner at Riad, which is a management consulting firm and an award-winning partner to Sage Group PLC. She's a thought leader with strong international background of developing business and managing multicultural teams. She's also been the president of Emirates Toastmasters International, a weekend painter and a classical music enthusiast. So I'll now request Shobha to kindly escort Ms. Indra Nui to the stage to kick off the fireside chat. Good morning and welcome to this very, very sought-after session that we are all here today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Indra K. Nui, a fellow alumnus of IM Calcutta, and who served as the very first female CEO and president of PepsiCo, uh, CEO and chairperson of PepsiCo from 2006 to 2019. At PepsiCo, her strategic thinking, her insight into consumer behavior, and her wisdom in managing a very vast and global workforce makes her, uh, uh, makes her a power to reckon with. Uh, she's also revered as a role model for women uh, and immigrants and celebrated for her empowering and inclusive messages. She's been awarded the Padma Bhushan, India's third highest civilian honor, the US State Department's award for outstanding American by choice, 15 honorary degrees. Okay. She was also inducted into the Asian Hall of Fame and National Women's Hall of Fame. She currently serves as the board of directors of Amazon and in the International Cricket Council. She's the author of the book, My Life in Full, Work, Family, and Future, a memoir that offers insight and a call to action on how our society can potentially blend work and family. Nui will be part of a very rich array of authors and literary luminaries at this year's Emirates Airlines Literature Festival. And I believe you're scheduled to be there today evening. Mm. So we wish you the very best. Thank you. In this book, Indra traces a very remarkable journey of a young girl from Chennai whom I can associate myself with so closely, as I was telling her just a little while ago, okay? who grows up to be the CEO and chairperson of PepsiCo, uh, which I think is a 70, 80 billion you know, dollar company. It is a very intimate, raw, and invigorating account with powerful stories, and I call them moments of truth. When a certain realization dawns on you and it propels you to move forward, She's incredibly special to all of us, especially here today, because as a fellow alumni, we can't ask for a better brand ambassador. Okay. And as a beacon of hope, for those who aspire to follow in her footsteps, I think today is going to be an absolutely mesmerizing session for every one of us. When I finished reading the book, Indra, it left me with a warm, fuzzy feeling of actually knowing you though I have met you just five minutes ago. Okay. And I realize that there is a congruence of life events uh, with your workplace and your home, and they do not necessarily need to exist in silos. So this was a huge takeaway for me, personally speaking. So it's a real honor and privilege to be here with you today, and welcome to the Pan IAM Summit on Leadership for the Future, Please help me in joining your hands in welcoming India. Thank you. Thank you, Shobha. And thanks to all of you, I am uh, alumni, for welcoming me to this event. Since I graduated in 1976 from IM Cal, 
11th batch, I'm dating yeah. myself. I haven't ever spoken at an IIM event, except mm -hmm. I spoke at a graduation at IIM Cal. Uh, and I've never been at an alumni event, so thank you for inviting me to speak to all of you. <laughs> really appreciate it. Um, you know, I have to tell you that um, all of us who went to IIMs are incredibly privileged. It is an extraordinary institution, uh, especially at the time when I went to IIM Cal, there were only two IIMs. You know, Ahmedabad and Calcutta, and then there was XLRI. Yeah. And I think Bajaj existed in Bombay. But beyond that, yeah. there wasn't any other management education. True. And the number of women were almost determined by the number of dorm rooms that were available. <laughs> and on our floor in I'm Cal, there were 12 rooms, and so there could only be six in every batch. Uh, the, the fact that we could even think of uh, you know, women in the class in, uh, on that metric was just crazy, but that's okay. Yeah. We were just happy to be there. So after I am Cal, this is my first interaction with all of you. So thank you for having me. And Shobha, it's all yours now. Great. So uh, we actually associate yourself and your trials of settling into a new country very closely because we have all done something very similar. Mm. Because we are all non-residents in a country here. And we are all trying to fit in. We are trying to settle in. And most importantly, we are all trying to thrive in a country where we have to respect the cultural nuances of what is accepted and what is not. And there are certain ways of doing things in every country, you know, in whichever part of the globe you go into. And thrive, what you did in a new country that you chose to call home, wow, that is something we would all like to ape as well. So which is why we are all here today to hear from you from your experiences. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the book is the storytelling. I think stories are a great way to um, give a message across without appearing to be a pontiff or without appearing to be patronizing. And you have done that so exceedingly well. So I have a question for you. Are you the storyteller? Or is it the work of Lisa Kassiner, whom you have acknowledged? So, yeah, yeah. She, I, actually, I worked with an extraordinary writer. But the way yeah. it worked is uh, once we decided to write the book and the publishers came forth and said, you know, we want to publish this book. Uh, the way we worked was I had to select a writer because, you know, if I was writing this book, I would have written it in six months, a bunch of bullet points, dash points, you know, slides. It <laughs> would have been unreadable. Actually, I take it back. It would have been eminently readable but forgettable. All right? But we wanted to make this book sticky. Yeah. And we wanted to uh, make it sticky because of the story of the arc of the life but also the lessons that it sort of resulted in, and then the policy options that came at the end. So we were trying to accomplish three goals. And here was a writer who didn't know me from Adam. You know, she was brand new. She'd never written a book before. She was a, an investigative reporter for Bloomberg. Okay. She'd been doing that for 22 years. So it was the first for Lisa. There was something about her I liked. And she'd never been to India, had never associated with Indian people. So you can imagine that this is like, I'm not going to talk about my Tata and the Unjal, and what is she going to know? <laughs> so I'm struggling with all this, but the way it worked was the following. Uh, she would just ask questions, random questions, yeah. and we recorded maybe uh, 70, 80 hours of uh, story, stories mm -hmm. and history and my life, um, and then we had it all transcribed. And she read all the transcriptions to see mm -hmm. what the story was. And uh, we agreed on the chapter framing. And then the big decision was, should we go by lesson or by chronology? Mm. Uh, because, you know, many people thought you should go with lessons, but I thought that would yeah. be boring. That sounded yeah. like a textbook. So we decided to go yeah. chronology, but lessons coming out of that. So, for example, chapter one, even though we talk about my upbringing in Madras, from that comes the lessons about how families are fragile, families yeah. are messy, I don't know a perfect family, I'll be honest with you. Absolutely. Families are messy. And education of the woman child is very important. Correct. So from that chapter came out these lessons. So we had to block out by chapter what stories, what lessons, and how do we make transitions happen from one chapter to another. Absolutely. So once we agree on the outline, she goes off and writes drafts. And then we work on 10, 15, 20 edits of every chapter. And pretty soon we have a book. The key thing for a writer is it's got to be told in my voice. Yes. She can't write in her voice because this is not her book. She's my scribe. It's quite She's a... an extraordinary writer, but she had to 
tell it in my voice. Absolutely. I think the authenticity remains intact. This is something, you know, which is incredible because for a person who is sort of stepping into your mind and trying to recollect and recreate those instances, I think she's done an amazing job and it's absolutely praiseworthy. She, she is a gifted, now she's a gifted writer of books. <laughs> she's written one. <laughs> So let's she's, go you the, know, I'm not joking. The number of requests she's gotten based on this one book is just extraordinary. So, and I push her everywhere I go. I go, you should hire Lisa. She's really, really good. Let's go back to your Unjil story. Uh -huh. In fact, when, we, when I personally read the book, it was almost like a, a time walk. I could actually imagine my grandparents' house, a multi-generation house with an Unjil, a patriarchal Tata sitting there and who would rule the household literally with a stare or a grunt, mm. you know, that kind of, uh, you know, upbringing. And also the angst of actually growing up in a very structured uh, Tam Bram family focused on education, who wanted you to blossom and grow wings, but at the same time you could only do it in that structured way in which they allowed you to do so. So your mother's, um, you know, threat, to say that she'll continuously, she'll get you and Chandrika married off at the age of 18, okay? You still manage to get out of that, you know, <laughs> microcosm and move on to IAM and Yale, okay? Did that allow you to dream outside your boundaries? Remember, my mother was an interesting uh, study in contrasts. Okay. She had one foot on the brake, one foot on the accelerator. So my life was full of dualities because had she been allowed to go to college, had she been allowed to study, she would have been a CEO. Absolutely. Yeah. Although none of us in our family knew what business was because we are Tambrams, we don't do business, right? And so you work in government, you're a lawyer, or Tell a doctor, me about or it. engineer, and business, what is business? So until my sister went to Ahmedabad, we didn't know what business was. Yeah. And I'll talk about that in a second. But mom had one foot on the brake and one foot in the accelerator. My grandfather said, let the granddaughters study as much as they want. I want them to dream big. And my father said the same thing. Hey, we got two girls and one boy. Let them do whatever they want. Don't stop yeah. them. My mother said the same thing. In fact, I've written in the book about the fact that at dinner time, while she uh, was eating, when we'd finished, she'd say, give me a speech on what you would do if you were chief minister of Madras or, or Tamil Nadu or prime minister of the country. And we would have to give a speech, and she would decide who to vote for. And the prize was half of one block of Cadbury's chocolate. You know the Cadbury's <laughs> chocolate blocks? Half of one square. And I'd lick it for like half an hour. And I have to tell you, that chocolate licking for half an hour tasted better than a whole bar of chocolate I can eat now. Okay, Very so true. when they say, when you have much, you want more. Uh -uh, when you have so little, you cherish it. But, so mom uh, wanted to live her life vicariously through us. At the same time, all her sisters and aunts and uncles were sitting on the unjal looking at horoscopes every afternoon. You know, <laughs> every random guy's horoscope would show up and they'd be comparing uh, horoscopes. So that was the foot on the brake. But I think between my father and my grandfather and her own dreams, she just said, I gotta let these kids go because they would make the guy miserable if I got them. <laughs> I think she did it out of service to society. <laughs> That's what so, I'd like to say. Let's fast forward you up to uh, the Pepsi days because that is where your pinnacle of achievements was done. And honestly, we don't have the time to go through the entire uh -huh. progress of your journey from selling thread in Bombay to you know, uh, your Boston Consulting Group assignment and ABB and Motorola. But let's go, let's fast forward a little bit to the Pepsi assignment. I see a critical juncture in your growth in Pepsi to a defining moment when you actually threatened to resign, not two years after you joined Pepsi, perhaps? I'm, I'm not exactly sure about mm. the timeline. And that was a tipping point where you actually went to Roger and he said, that's it, you know, this is, this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to be out of this altogether. Okay. Now, this is an interesting story for all of us here because give me one person who has grown the ranks in any company out here who hasn't faced such a situation where we have had the dilemma of deciding, do I? Don't I? Okay. So what is your advice? You know, you have to be very, very careful about adopting those nuclear tactics. And I'll tell you why. My husband and I decided we were going to live our life on one salary, the lower of the two salaries. So we lived our life on one of, one of the two salaries. 
That was important because we never wanted to be beholden to a job. Mm -hmm. We never wanted to live life so richly that we needed two salaries and we were spending mm -hmm. enormous amounts of money. So the house we live in, we've lived in it for 32 years. Okay? We added to it over time, but you know, it's literally, uh, it's not a CEO house at all. Uh, and because we lived like that, I could afford to walk in and say, I'm quitting. Because I thought I'd find another job, or worse still, mm -hmm. we'd live on one salary, yeah. no problems. And we had enough savings because we don't spend much, and we, don't, we didn't go out much. And so uh, I wouldn't try it if you don't have that level of uh, safety nets. Uh, the most important lesson was if you're not respected, or if you feel people are taking you for granted, mm -hmm. don't put up with it. Because once you start giving people license to behave that way, yeah. they will take more room. And uh, many times, my observation is that, and I'll speak of the US, in the non-tech world, because I think tech is a whole different area, uh, people of Indian origin sometimes do get walked over. Mm -hmm. And they accept it. Uh, and they accept it because they haven't crafted a proposition for themselves. Plan B. Not plan B. They haven't crafted a brand for themselves and a proposition for themselves where the company says, I can't do without this person. Uh, they haven't made themselves so important to the company. So don't just show up for work and you know, just do your work and disappear. Think about what's the brand. If you want to move ahead, what's the proposition? What's the brand? And if you don't want to and just want the salary, put up with being walked over. Yeah. But if you want to be noticed, if you want to move ahead, it's a whole different MO, modus operandi that you have to follow. That's interesting. And I think one of the very key elements which you are branded with is performance with purpose. Okay? And it's especially interesting because uh, you, you sensed a need to go against the grain of what was considered acceptable at that point in time. Mm. Okay? And you came up with these uh, three uh, buzz phrases, nourish, replenish, and cherish. I, I, I really like the those three, you know, because it's so pithily, it sort of sums up what everything it's all about. Mm. So would you like to, you know, explore that a little bit and expand on that? Yeah, it's interesting because when I took over in 2006, took over PepsiCo, I wanted to make sure that PepsiCo was future-proofed. And basically my thought was, this company should remain successful for many, many years, not just for the duration of the CEO. It's not about cutting investments and making a lot of money and then leaving when the yeah. going gets tough. I wanted to build a fundamental company that would remain successful for many years. So I looked, future, I looked at the future, looked at the mega trends that were going to impact the company in the future, and I worked backwards. And I said, if these are the mega trends that are going to impact the company, what do I need to do differently in the company? I needed to shift the portfolio to healthier products. Mm -hmm. not, that, not that I'm walking away from the core portfolio. I had to add healthier products. I had to really focus on the environment, and I had to focus on the kind of people we were going to bring into the company because mm -hmm. people didn't want to work for consumer companies. They yeah. wanted to work in tech or the financial industry because they paid more. And the most important part is had I not focused on transforming the portfolio, I would not have been able to deliver performance. Had we not focused on environmental initiatives, our costs would have gone up or we would have not had a license to operate in many societies. So this was a mit mitigation of risk to the company. And if we hadn't worked on getting our people, the right talent into the company, the company could not have maintained its growth because we wouldn't have had the right people to maintain the growth. So performance with purpose was not a corporate social responsibility program. It was a new way to make money. So in many ways, it was de-risking the corporation. If you look at it through a risk lens or future-proofing the company, if you want to look at it through a growth lens. Mm -hmm. And fast forward today, that's what ESG is all about. Mm -hmm. It started off as a CSR project. CSR is about giving away the money you make. Mm -hmm. Find a charity program you want to give it to and then feel good about it. That is not what I was doing. So it was how to make money differently. Mm -hmm. So when we did Performance with Purpose, people said, she's crazy. She's a Mother Teresa. Why do we need a Mother Teresa running a soda and chips company? Yeah. And this is where I faced perhaps the biggest challenge because I'd go to see investors, and they'll say to me, uh, why the hell do you have to have healthier products? 
I'd look at them and say, because healthier products are taking away 50% of my growth. Little, little upstarts are taking away all the growth. I'd look at them and say, have you changed your eating and drinking habits? Oh yeah, I have, absolutely. <laughs> Gave up all the soda business. Now I'm eating and drinking healthy. I said, so, but if you've changed your habits, and all of you in this room have not touched the regular sugar products, you're only drinking Diet Pepsi and Aquafina, why do you think other consumers haven't changed it? They may have, but I want you to keep doing what you're doing. So the dilemma was the moral code of people's lives and the moral code of their livelihoods were in contrast as opposed to coming together. You see, you understand yep. what I'm saying? The moral code of their life and the moral code of their livelihoods were in contrast. And every time I called out that question, they'd get uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. They'd really get uncomfortable rather than say, you're right, you've got to keep doing what you're doing. So six years after I started it, people said, oh my God, Indra's prescient. And when I retired, they said, she was the early uh, you know, design of ESG, and mm -hmm. wow, she's awesome. But when you're the first six years of your tenure, you're, you're coming to work every day saying, I'm gonna, if, am I going to have a job? Mm -hmm. Except for the fact that my board said, this is the only way to run the company, keep doing what you're doing. I could have been thrown out any day. But again, remember, we were living on one salary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I told my board, Performance with purpose is the only way I know how to run PepsiCo. If you want to Very change the strategy, you've got to get a different CEO. And if you want a different strategy, you've got to explain it to me because the mega trend says this is what I have to do. So if you want a different strategy, either you have new mega trends or you're going to ignore the mega trends that I've told you exist. What's the fact? Yep. They said we accept your mega trends, we accept your strategy, just keep doing what you're doing and we'll back you up. And I have so, to add another adjective to that. Performance with purpose, with kindness and compassion. Yeah, but well that's, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, Actually, is, I'll, I'll, show, I'll tell you something. <laughs> kindness and compassion, yes, was there. But also, many people who work for me would say, standards are too high, she's tough to work with, uh, she's never happy with our output. Oh, yes. So there was a little bit of that too. Some people call me dragon lady, that's okay. Yeah. But along with that was also the kindness. Yeah. Because compassion. there's a very heart-tugging story uh, uh, which I was reflecting on and I actually held on to the book at that point in time for a long, long time. And that was about you writing to the parents of your 26 staff member team. I think you had 26 people at that point in time when you decided to write to the parents of every one of them to tell them how valued they were yeah. and how you loved having them on working with you and how you had that relationship going with those parents, regardless of the employees who were also you know, working with you. I thought that was an amazing um, gesture, if mm. I may say so, uh, because in order to stretch yourself out of the regular work that you do and all that it takes, and to find still the time and the compassion to write something like this, I thought was amazing. Do you want to reflect on how you felt about that? Well, you know, when I went to India in 2006 or 7, I think, uh, I went to Madras to see my mom. She was there. My father passed away a long time ago. And mom would say, just dress up and sit here. People are going to come to see you. Okay, you just dress up and sit there. People would come. People I never knew existed in our family showed up. They'd come to me and say, hello. They'd go to my mother and say, congratulations. <laughs> your daughter became CEO. must be because of your efforts. And she'd say, yep, my prayers. I pray four hours a day. That's how my daughter became CEO. So she stood there and she took all the credit. <laughs> but she didn't take it for herself. She said she prayed and that's why it all came. And everybody just thanked my mother. So I asked her, why do you need me here? She said, oh, you just sit there because you need to make sure they see it. So I just sat there for three or four hours. And I, I ref uh, that's when I started to reflect saying, I've never thanked the parents of my direct reports for the gift of their child to PepsiCo. Yeah. And remember, whatever I write is going to be a positive report card. It's not a negative report card. So when I came back, I had 16 direct reports at that time. Uh, I went a little step further. I wrote them all a personal letter, a long letter, about why I was writing to them, yeah. um, and then telling them what their son or daughter was doing for PepsiCo. And I ended every letter with, thank you for the gift of you know, Larry to PepsiCo. And then I visited the parents of all my direct reports. So stage one, I visited every one of them. I went around the world. So I got to know them very well. But then when we had small group leadership meetings, I'd, 
had these meetings about three or four hundred executives. Mm -hmm. I wrote to parents of all of these uh, executives. So ultimately, we sent out about four hundred letters, very personal letters. Now let me tell you the reaction. Uh, is Ajay Shrikhande here? Where is Ajay? Ajay. Ajay and I are the same class. Pavan Bhatia. How many of you know Pavan? Pavan was the head of HR for PepsiCo in Dubai. Uh, Pavan's father got a letter. Pavan said to me in Delhi, uh, gets the letter. He makes a hundred copies of the letter. And he takes a chair, sits in the front of his apartment building. Everybody who comes in gives them a copy of the letter. <laughs> I thought it was the cutest thing that is absolutely <laughs> adorable. But think of it. When we have two daughters, the boss of one of the daughters, we ran into him at a dinner party and he said, you know, Preeta's doing really well at the job. My husband and I came home, we thought she had won the Nobel Prize. We were floating on cloud nine because we live our lives through our kids' success. Yeah. And so this letter made all the difference to parents, but it opened up a, a relationship between the parents and me. They would write me letters. They would go to stores and take pictures and send it to me, you know, what the Pepsi shelf looked like or the Frito-Lay shelf looked like. They would make cakes. They would knit me scarves. And when the son got home or the daughter got home, how's my friend Indra doing would be the first question. <laughs> they wouldn't ask, Al, how are you? Or Hugh, how are you? How's my friend Indra doing? And Al tells me, Al Carey, one of our executives tells me, he told his mom, old lady, 87 or something, you know, mom, she's being really tough on me. And the mom said, uh-uh, she's my friend. Don't try it. <laughs> and so it, you know, it established a relationship yeah. with us that was fantastic. But more importantly, the executives were so proud that this had happened. I'll tell you one other story. Zain Abdullah was um, uh, Egyptian, I think. And he was based in London. Yeah. And he was running Europe for us. Zain's mother was British. And she had come to Dubai to visit another son. And Zayn knew his mother was getting the letter because I copied him on the letter. Yeah. Um, his mother calls Zayn and says, Zayn, there's a letter from Indra, your chairman. It's come to my home in England. And our neighbor called and said, this letter's come. What do I do? Is it bad? Now, Zayn knew what the letter said. So he said, Mom, have her open the letter because he wanted the town to know about the letter. <laughs> so the neighbor opened the letter, and she called her, the mother and said, this is what the letter says. And the mom rushed back to the town. And it's almost like she got a ticker tape parade in the town because of this letter. So it gave parents enormous satisfaction and happiness getting this letter. See, this is the thing that I, I really uh, you know, I love about you, is that you have this, this element of reaching out and empathy, and for lack of a better word. Yeah. And at the same time, you are that cold, calculating, numerical engine. When I see the way you have progressed across some very difficult journeys when you took some strategic decisions mm. to improve the you know, bottom line of uh, PepsiCo. So, so I guess being data-driven has been in your DNA, but there are uh, certain elements where perhaps an intuition or a, an intuitive process supports these decisions, perhaps? I don't know. So is that a mix and a match? You know, look, after you've worked in so many industries and so many businesses, but more importantly, worked with so many extraordinary leaders, you learn how to balance gut, uh, analytics, uh, you know, experiences all together. Okay, you just learn that. It's, a, it's an acquired skill. And if you don't have that skill, you cannot you know, become CEO. I tell you, CEO jobs are incredibly difficult jobs. They're incredibly difficult. And just to give you an idea, PepsiCo, when uh, you know, I was running it, uh, midterm was about $60 billion, with a market cap of about $160 billion. It was a Fortune 50 company. And uh, when I became CEO, a reporter told me this, which I've never forgotten. Uh, he said, Indra, we're going to spend the next two years writing about you as the greatest thing that happened. I said, why do you want to do that? Why don't you take it easy? You know, let me put some points on the board, then you can write about me. He said, no, first of all, you're different, so we're going to write about you. We're going to build you and build you and build you. And looking at him, why? He goes, because when we take you down, the fall will be bigger if we build you up. Okay. Tell me this. <laughs> and so that is the kind of focus you get as a CEO, especially a female CEO who's an immigrant person of color. because. What right do you have to be running this iconic, 
red, white, Brand, and blue yes, company. Absolutely. You know, how did you get a seat at the table? Yeah. Uh, you know, what do you bring to the table? So the first, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that your board and your predecessor have all endorsed you and you've gotten there. When you start this job, you're in a hole. You dig your hole and you say, stay there, and you've got to work yourself out of the hole. You've got to show that you can do way better than anybody else, in spite of all of the opposition you get. So you had the media telling you this. They craft a picture of you wearing a sari and walking barefoot in the office. I've never worn a sari to office. Neither have I ever walked bare feet, except if I was working late and my heels, you know, my feet swell up because I've been on it the whole day. I'd kick it off at 8 o'clock in the night or 7 o'clock in the night and walk around bare feet. That's not walking around bare feet in office hours. And in the night when I was really exhausted, I would hum a tune. And the newspaper article would say, she wears saris, walks bare feet, and sings in the office. <laughs> you read all but, the articles. But you do I'm sing. Like, you do sing. No, but I, I don't that. sing in the office when I'm in a meeting or something like that. They made it look like I sit in a meeting and I sing. I am about the most buttoned up person on these issues. And so yeah, I had to cope with all of this is what I'm trying to tell you. At a point when I didn't even know how to dress. I want to be honest with you. In the early years, I sometimes look at my clothes and I go, oh my God, I look like, you know, like crap. Right. But then over time it got better. But, you know, it was a tough, tough haul through the early days and getting to where I was. I can, I can totally get that. And if you see, um, so there's one element of the challenge that comes from the background you come from and having to be better than what you are and mm. so on. And increasingly, I think uh, the challenges are now coming from the environment. Because if you see what has been happening in the last couple of years, we are in a very rapidly changing world where technology is playing a huge role. Mm -hmm. And you would think that at one point in time, technology was only about those background processes. But no, they're increasingly defining the design of the bottle, perhaps, and, and how something is consumed or how the products are distributed and so on. At the same time, you have a workforce which is relatively old-fashioned, you know, mm -hmm. and they haven't been able to keep up with the times. So how do we ensure that the employees are upskilled and so that they stay relevant and they're able to contribute and the, and the entire company doesn't depend upon, say, an external consultant to you know, do something for you, which is, which is, which is not really a workable model? How you know, you there's a great line which says, the distance between a number one and a number two is a constant. Anywhere in the company, the distance between a number one and number two is a constant, meaning if you want the organization to upskill itself, the boss better upskill him or herself. Mm -hmm. If the CEO wants to send a message that the organization needs to retrain itself in certain areas, the CEO has to show that they're attending training programs and retraining themselves. Too often, CEOs think that they can delegate all that and just rubber stamp something. But if you as a CEO only want to sign things that you understand, you almost have to be a lifelong learner yourself. Yeah. And this is a very, very important thing because you have to be a lifelong learner on so many topics in a rapidly changing environment. Second, uh, you provide all the opportunities to people to take refresher courses, reskill themselves. You put in place sort of a schedule, give them time off to go take these courses. But if they don't take it, it's like taking a horse to the water, but if it doesn't drink, it's going to die. So you take people there, provide all these opportunities. You wait to see if they avail themselves of these opportunities. Absolutely. If they don't, yeah. you have got to move them out. Absolutely. Because blockers are the worst things in an organization because they prevent you know, great talent from coming up, and then they thwart progress in the company. So you've got to rem remove the blockers. At the senior levels, it becomes a challenge because, I don't know if you realize this, at the senior levels, it's up or out. You can't just stay there without reskilling yourself because either you reskill yourself and remake yourself constantly, or you've got to allow somebody else to take your job because, as I said, the distance between the number one and two is a constant. Any one of your direct reports ought to be lifting their game yeah. so that the people below them can be lifted too. So people development is a very difficult thing to do for companies I because there's reskilling, there's motivating people to get reskilled, uh, giving them assignments through assignmentology, figuring out how to expand their thinking. Uh, and so reskilling is one part of it, 
there are multiple aspects yeah. so that you can get them ready for sort of the workforce of the future, if you want to call it that. In fact, we have faced this in my experience when we handle ERP projects. Uh -huh. And uh, this is something we always request is a top-down ownership from the top downwards. Otherwise, it really doesn't yeah. you know, take off the ground. And I think the same top-down approach is, I think, very important, as you have rightly pointed out, in ensuring um, inclusivity, not just diversity. Because as you mentioned, diversity is a metric and inclusivity is a mindset. Mm -hmm. And I think this also has to come from a top-down approach. Otherwise, it's not really perceived down below with a sense of comfort. So would you like to reflect on that? Well, you know, um, every company today has a DNI initiative. And um, some, t some fail, some succeed. And let me give you from PepsiCo's perspective what worked and didn't. You can't practice inclusive behavior in a company unless you have a critical mass of diversity. Think about it. If you have two people in the top 50 executives who are diverse and everybody else is of one kind, how are you going to teach inclusive behavior? Because mm -hmm. is everybody going to practice inclusive behavior on these two people? Mm -hmm. It's not going to work. Okay. So stage one is quotas. You have to put some quotas and numbers in place to get the appropriate critical mass of diverse people in. Mm -hmm. Then you practice, you, know, you train on inclusive behavior. And it's got to be a give and take. The people who are diverse should give feedback on what's working and not working. And the people who are not diverse ought to really take that feedback to heart and then figure out how to make changes. The problem is too often we don't have a critical mass of diverse people. They give inclusion training. They make people go through it. And then people go right back to their old behaviors yeah. because there's nobody to practice it on. Yeah. Yeah. So don't look at quotas as something bad. It's bad if it's not in the early stages. So if it's in the early stages, start with a quota. Insist that the numbers are get to 25 30% diverse people. And I hope in the IIM group yeah. it gets to that number too at some yeah. point. Okay. So 25 30% diverse, and then build the inclusion behavior on top of that. I think so too. Yeah, I think this can't happen overnight. It starts with numbers and then becomes yep. a mindset. I don't think it one happens without the other either. And talking about mindsets now, I know that as women we have some special challenges, if I may put it that way, when we are trying to approach our career and to you know to grow with our careers. Um, and as people, I think we are fundamentally different because I see that even with, between me and my husband. I mean, I know certain secrets about my employees and my husband has no clue. Yeah. So it, <laughs> I think this is a fundamentally a different mindset that we carry uh, where we are empathetic by way, our very nature. We are nurturing by our very nature. But does empathy and consensus building, uh, does it get misunderstood for a weakness because you are a woman CEO? get perceived that as a weakness by whom though by uh, by the stakeholders by by the investors by the by the board because they say you know you should be the the guy who goes out and you know gets things done and i know you had this uh, famous interview with steve jobs for instance yeah i can't exactly call him an empathetic person he has that short temper and he used to throw things around but he was considered a great ceo and I think he gave you some advice as well. You know, well, on that was lines. on design. Let me come back to the core point you're making, which is a very good one. Yeah. As long as you're getting results, I don't care how you get it. Mm -hmm. Only thing is, whatever approach you take, better be acceptable to your employees. Mm -hmm. You can't shout, you can't throw things around, you can't utter four-letter words all the time. It doesn't work on a sustained basis, especially if you have a diverse group of employees. Mm -hmm. If you have a bunch of bros with you, yeah. and they're all used to talking that way, maybe it works. The company becomes the giant locker room. Yeah. Yeah. But those days are gone. Yeah. Uh, today, if you want the best and the brightest, you have to be, uh, practice inclusive talk. And if you want to do that, I think whether you get it through lack of emotion, as I say, head and hands, or head, heart, and hands, which, you know, which is, always is usually than, associated which is with better. women. It's okay. But I'll be honest with you. Uh, I think that when women get, many women who are CEOs mm -hmm. are tougher than the men sometimes because they have to survive in that job. 
Mm -hmm. Literally, survival as a woman in a CEO suite mm -hmm. is tough because you got the media constantly questioned. There was one time where every woman CEO in the US was targeted by activists. Mm -hmm. Every woman CEO had an activist investor. Is that coincidence or what? And our companies were not you know, poorly run at all. But we were all being targeted because the activists were hoping that we would buckle, <laughs> OK? Um, women CEOs, and you know, we all meet and talk. We used to meet and talk when I was still in business. Uh, we have had board members talk over us, or our own executives talk over us, or roll their eyes when women talk. So we've all been through this, all right? Uh, and so it's tough when you get to the top. So you have to have resilience. You have to have courage. You have to have a backbone. You've got to be tough. Mm -hmm. At the same time, you cannot completely divorce yourself from who you are. Mm -hmm. So if you are a person with a lot of empathy, keep that empathy. Mm -hmm. If you didn't have it in the first be place, be authentic. Yeah. Just be, you know, be whoever yourself. you want to be. Yeah. At the end of the day, you have to hold on to your yeah. people. Yeah. That's the toughest job we yeah. all have. Yeah. I totally and extract agree. the best performance out yeah. of them. Yeah. 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 Deploy the right tactics for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. So if we were to say, here's a 101, okay, for a CEO mindset, and we pick the top three adjectives that we want to pick on. There are many, you know, mm -hmm. there are many, many characteristics. What would your favorite top three be? You know, at the end of the day, um, if a CEO, any CEO, is not curious and in the, in, the, in the search for lifelong learning, I wouldn't think the CEO would be successful. CEOs mm -hmm. who get to the job and then say, I've arrived, let me mm -hmm. work half a day, play golf the other half a day, those days are over. Our CEOs today have to be eternally seeking for the next thing and the next thing and the next thing and what they need to bring into the company to change the company. So I look for CEOs who have that ability to be curious, insatiable curiosity coupled with lifelong learning. Uh, the second is this whole issue of courage. Um, you know, you can have all the knowledge, but if you don't have the courage to implement it in the company, what's the point having the knowledge? I agree. And if you're going to buckle under the first sign of pressure, or change your strategy, or change your direction because you want to appease somebody. You know, that's just not a winning strategy because you cannot articulate a new strategy and have the organization follow you because they'll say, another critic comes, he or she will change the strategy. So you have to demonstrate to the company that you believe in what you're doing and stick with it through thick and thin. So I look for a lot of courage. And the final thing is, uh, you know, the compass has to point to true north. Integrity is very important. Mm -hmm. You see, integrity is the one thing where there isn't a 90, 90 you know, so-and-so is 90% integrity or 85% integrity. It's a zero or a hundred thing, mm -hmm. okay? So if somebody's got a little bit of an issue and you sense that they're not on the level completely, mm -hmm. they are not CEO material. And yeah. if they are accidental CEOs, you can be sure there's going to be a problem downstream. Yeah. No, I think that's a very meaningful uh, interpretation of and summarization of essentially the crux of what it takes to have a CEO mindset. Mm -hmm. I totally get that. So what we are going to do is we're going to go beyond this long discussions, you know, interpolation, and we're going to have something which is fun, what okay. I call as the rapid fire. Uh -huh. okay? And um, Maybe we can uh, brand this, since I see many branding people sitting out here. <laughs> okay. Shawarma with Shobha. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. Okay. So now these are questions. These are fun questions. All There's right. nothing like a right answer. Uh -huh. Yeah. And uh, you don't have to give the right answer. Yeah. Mm. But you can't pass. I can't pass. Okay. Okay. So when you have pending work to do, are you a morning lark or a night owl? 24-7. <laughs> You're thirsty. Will you reach out for Pepsi or buttermilk? Neither. Water. That's not an acceptable Water. answer. <laughs> you, hey, you asked me for an honest answer. Right. Now, you feel like crunching something. Yeah, it's something salty and something nice. Muruku or Doritos? Lay's potato. <laughs> okay. You have a bad hair day, yeah? But I always see your hair perfect, by the way, yeah? But you have a bad hair day. Okay. 
how do you take care of this? A colorful Moroccan turban, douse a lot of gel on your hair, ignore it and make it into your style statement. Pull out my hairbrush and give it a few rubs and it's there. <laughs> Simple answer, we have as little hair as I do. Two things with a hairbrush and you're all set. Although, you know, I tell you, when I took the cover photograph for the book, Annie Leibovitz, who's a very famous photographer, took the picture. And she looked at my hair and she said, it looks like a wig. You cannot have your hair so properly combed. So she brought the greatest hairstylist from New York, Sally Hirschberger, who is like the number one hairstylist for the little hair. She brought her and she spent the whole day mussing it up like this. She said, the hair has to have movement. So you don't even need a hairbrush. You just have to muss it up and it's okay. That's your style. Yeah. This is a common expert. <laughs> How many windows do you have in your office room today? Because six. you've always spoken about six. the number of windows going up. I have six windows and a furniture that looks exactly like my office furniture in Mexico, except <laughs> on a slightly smaller scale. <laughs> yeah. And I have one final question mm. for you. Roger Enrico, the showman. Steve Renneman, the one ply. What was Indra Nui? What's your nickname? What's my nickname? Dragon Lady? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've had so many names. All in affection, but interesting yeah. names. Yeah. But uh, we'll settle for Dragon Lady. That's like we're in the Middle East. That yeah. sounds good to me. Close to China, to so Dragon Lady is good. <laughs> I have a secret to share with you. Mm. I'm a fellow Scorpion. Oh, Scorpio. Yes, a yeah, Scorpio. Yeah. So I did what you did some time back. I pulled out the classifieds and I tried finding out what was in store for me today. You want to listen? Please, tell me. OK, great. An upcoming visit from someone close may have you working overtime in order to fix your house, Scorpio. Okay. Ah. This is fine up to a point, but be careful. Some of the stuff that looks good in the store might not look quite the same once you get it home. Your guest is more interested in you. Oh, my god. <laughs> OK. <laughs> The reason she's referring to this is because you, all of you have read the book already? Maybe you should no. expand on that. Yeah. yeah, so Roger Enrico was my boss. He was a CEO, very tough boss, very difficult to work with. Couldn't function in the mornings, only function in the night till 3 or 4 in the morning. Um, didn't speak much, never liked anybody. Um, and when I first met him, he always hired the head of corporate strategy, but he didn't hire me. So he was always mad that I came in hired by Wayne Calloway and not by Roger Enrico, who was at that time a vice chair. So he, he became head of restaurants and he said, come with me, we're going on a market tour. Okay. So I met him in Atlanta and we just ate our way through restaurants, then went to Chicago, ate our way through restaurants, just doing this every day, morning to night. And on the flight back, I decided this man hasn't really talked one word to me. So I'm reading the newspaper and says on that, you will be traveling with somebody who will make your life very difficult. <laughs> okay. So I circled it. I gave it to him. And I said, Roger, I'd like you to read this. He read, reads this, gives it back to me and says, I'm a Scorpio too. <laughs> <laughs> and so I go, OK, now at least we know exactly what. <laughs> I mean, we, I mean, we were very, very close uh, subsequently <laughs> until he died. But, uh, but I'm just telling you, that's how our relationship started. We both understood each other. Are you November Scorpio, October? November Scorpio. Very different people than October Absolutely. Scorpios. <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole different one-on-one -on -one discussion. Yeah, yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. So, um, so we'll just take a quick stock, uh, take of the time we have for uh, an open round for questions. Do we have some 10 minutes? OK, so uh, we're going to open the floor for a few questions. Sure. Everybody is bursting to ask you their questions. I have asked you quite a few. Right. I think I should share this love. I think you may need yep. a mic. Uh, India, how did you manage being a mother and being a CEO? Was that difficult? Remember, I was lucky in many ways. I married a wonderful, wonderful man. And in our family, we don't say family is female. We say family is husband and wife. In many, many families, they say family is female. The woman has to worry about the children. The woman has to worry about the home. Perish that thought, OK? When you have a kid, it's the responsibility of both husband and wife. 
So my husband was an absolutely equal partner with me in bringing up our daughters. Second, I had the luck of families, both my in-laws and my own family. Both came in to help. So we'd have this calendar, especially when the kids were small, we didn't trust them with babysitters. So we would have babysitters and then the family member around the house constantly. We would have, because we had to get visas for them, uh, we'd have two-year calendars, who's coming for three months, you know. We'd plan out. And all the uncles and aunts who had accumulated vacation in the government jobs, take three months, four months vacation and come. Just watch TV the whole day, that's it. But, you know, but they were there as my solace. Um, and I had a wonderful in-law family. They too did the same thing. And this is a piece of advice to many of the men in the room. The way you set the stage for your wife to have a job will determine how your parents behave with your wife. My husband basically said, Indra's gonna work. Very true. And at our wedding, my father-in-law pulled me aside and said, keep working, whatever you wanna do, we're proud of you and we're gonna support you. So all my mother-in-law, father-in-law, aunts-in-law, everybody came to help. Um, our neighbors were all very, very friendly. So they would pop in at odd times, but they were never the same time every day. And they would call and leave a message with my secretary if they saw something they didn't like. Uh, and then I had the best secretaries, oh my God. I'll give you a little example. Uh, in those days when we didn't have, remember I was CEO when we didn't have the smartphone. Uh, didn't have Zoom, none of that. Today is all different. Um, when my kids were small, they had strict rules on what they could do to play Nintendo or whatever. Uh, my daughter would call the office. I want to speak to my mommy. They all knew immediately it was my daughter calling because who else is going to call at 6 o'clock and say, can I speak to your mommy? And I would be somewhere in the Far East early in the morning. They wouldn't put the call through to me. They would say, Tara, have you finished your homework? Have you done this? So there's a checklist they'd go through. And then they'd say, OK, you can play Nintendo for half an hour. And they'd leave me a voicemail. Tara called. This is the questioning we went through. And we gave her permission to play Nintendo for half an hour. I'd pick up that message. And now it's seamless parenting, you see. So we're all working together. And I would not say, who asked you to play Nintendo for half an hour? Because I knew that the receptionist had gone through the checklist and given permission. So we had to work these systems in because it takes a village. We're dealing with full-time jobs everywhere. But whatever you do, the kids are never going to be happy. Especially if you have daughters, the mothers become the punching bags. OK? <laughs> they put that knife and turn it all the time. But that's OK. Because when you don't work, the mother has the rage later on, saying, why did I study? Why am I staying home? Why is it I have no economic freedom? And God help if some, the families are fragile and they break up. What's to happen? So I'm of the opinion that let's provide the support structures to allow both husband and wife to work, but work flexibly so that you can also come home and be with the kids. And as long as we think of family as family and not family as female, and men in power come to the table, we could actually have a better society than we have today. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> any questions? Any other questions? I can see some. Let's take that lady up there. Um, Ma'am, you're such an inspiration. I'm really pinching myself to be here today. Um, first of all, um, I also come from a background where um, the roles are defined by the gender that you're born in. And typically, um, born into a woman, you have a certain pre notion about what is your role, what you will be defined by being a mother, being a wife. So it's women like you who we look up to, and I think you've been an um, inspiration to me and to a lot of other little girls as well who've um, grown up to seeing you. What is, as much as you know, you've talked about inclusivity, and uh, we can see today that world is definitely shifting over. There's more inclusivity now. But of course, there are still barriers. And sometimes as, as women, um, we are tired with these uh, notions about, you know, about going forward, about being strong enough. What is that one advice that you would give as a woman um, to another woman who's trying to make it big in, the, in this corporate world, as a, woman of, as a woman and that too of color, and the kind of um, role that you reach to survive and sustain in this uh, corporate world? So I, I'm going to uh, 
give all of you an honest perspective, not just for women overall, but then let's bring it down to women. Think of the corporate pyramid. Just think of it, okay? It's a pyramid, it's a very steep pyramid. At the entry level, I'll just take our company, it's about 15,000 people that come into the company in the first level. By the time you get to the C-suite, there's 14 or 15 people, and one person becomes the CEO. So there's a attrition process that happens along the pyramid that's pretty, pretty tough, all right? So if you want to be at that tippy top, at every stage you have to do better than everybody, not just in the job, but you almost have to show that you're ready for the next job because you've done something to learn the next job. You've got to be wired a certain way where you have less sleep, you're willing to read, and you're willing to speed read things. I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy job to rise to the top. It's a tough slog to get to the top. I'm being honest about this. So early in your career, you've got to decide what is important for you. Okay? If you want to have a good job, you want to have a family and make it all work, and you want to make your marriage work, marriage is a challenge by itself because that requires enormous attention. As my husband always says, your list is PepsiCo, PepsiCo, PepsiCo. <laughs> then it's your children, as if it's not his. Then your mother, and somewhere in the bottom, I'm there. I'll say, at least you're on the list. Just be happy, OK? <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, he knows he's important. But you know, it's, marriage has, needs some attention, too. So you have to decide, based on who you're married to, is your spouse willing to take that bottom of the list very often? Because when you have kids, the spouse falls to the bottom immediately. Kids do take up a lot of time. And when you're in a company in a senior position, you owe the company enormous commitment because so many lives and livelihoods are dependent on your leadership. So don't think that as you move up, it's just a job. It's no longer a job. It's a calling. It's a commitment. It's, it's extraordinary what you have to do. So you have to decide what you want to do in terms of how far you want to go and how much effort you're willing to put in. Now, you can still have a great job and rise a bit slower, but that requires trade-offs too. So I hope you've married the right person. Who's your, is your husband here? No? OK. I hope you've married the right. He's taking care of the kids. Oh, God <laughs> bless him. So uh, you know, um, just marry the right person. And make sure you have the right in-law family, too. To me, I'm hearing too many stories about in-laws thwarting women rising because you come home and they say, we're waiting for you to cook. And then we have television shows that show that image. And at the same time, in five episodes later, the girl is giving a lecture about how women should be allowed to dream. I don't understand the Indian TV shows anymore. I've been watching this show called Anupama. I've stopped it. <laughs> I've stopped watching that show. It is the most driving me up the wall. But I've got to tell you, you have to decide where you want to go and what kind of commitment of time you want to make. These are real, honest conversations you have to have with your family and decide where you want to end up. Okay. Incredible. So on your own, um, just know in a changing world today with technology, you can have more flexibility, which helps. Had I had flexibility, I wouldn't have traveled as much. I could have come home at 3.30 or 4, taken my kids off the bus, you know, had a snack with them, and when they were doing homework, gone back to study. I had, didn't have that luxury. Now you have it. So think hard about how technology is going to make your life easier, but it's also going to make your life difficult because you have to learn a lot more. Yeah. So think about this whole challenge holistically, and then decide what you want to do. Remembering one thing, there will always be regrets either way. <laughs> Just live with those regrets, OK? We take one final question. Do we have time? How are we for time? Yeah, I think uh, someone in the front here. I don't know where the microphones are. Yeah. 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 So, you spoken about cricket today, personally? Oh, cricket? OK. Yeah. I mean, I know that you're a cricket enthusiast, and now you're on the board of the ICC. The corporate uh, times and the experiences there, how is it shifting cricket and ICC and where things go forward in this world? Is, that, is, your, is your coming on board making an impact here and making any difference how things go? And how do you deal with those prima donnas who d generally you know, are in these boards? You see, cricket's unusual because unlike 
almost all other sports. You know, I used to be involved in the NFL, the MLB, the NBA, the NHL, because PepsiCo was partners with all these sports, the UEFA, all of them. Um, there wasn't as much of a national connection as cricket has. Uh, and so the country gets involved. The local, uh, whether it's BCCI or Cricket England or Cricket Australia, the country government is also vested in the success of that sport. So it's no longer just a standalone commercial sport, it's a national uh, pride. So when you're dealing with countries, it's very hard to make commercial decisions independent of country interests. Okay, so you can't take monies from BCCI and allot it to grow the sport in other countries without BCCI you know, really agreeing to it, which means it has to go through the political aspects of the sport and then come back. So it makes governing cricket much harder. Um, and my role was not just to be a female on the ICC board, which is all male. Uh, it's interesting, we have women's cricket, but there's no women's cricketer representation on the board, but that's for a different day. Uh, but they could have gotten any woman, they got an outspoken, you know, uh, meddlesome me. It's because they were wanting to change the way they were doing things. Uh, there was too much inbreeding inside. So I asked the questions that should have been asked and were not asked, so I get to ask those questions now. And, um, you know, cricket's changing. Uh, we want to develop more uh, teams, not to play tests, more to play ODIs. Uh, so the entry point would probably be ODIs and then to play T20, which is the toughest sport to play. And only have a few, you know, eight or 10 countries playing test cricket, which is really not the preferred format for the future. And if we can get cricket into the Olympics, that could be a huge win for us. So we're working through all of this uh, with great care to see what can be done. How are we doing for time? And um, do we have time? Okay. So um, I'd like to wrap up this session. Incredible insights. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege to be with you, Indra. And I hope you enjoyed the session as much as we did. Very yeah. much. Thank you. You were wonderful, Shobha. Thank you very much. So while taking the stage after Indra Ma'am's talks feels like, you know, Ashish Nehra coming out too bad after Sachin Tendulkar got out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but he got uh, out, yeah. Uh, so thank you so much, Indra Ma'am, for your wonderful uh, session. Thanks a lot, Shobha, as well, for bringing out many of those insights and experiences to life. Uh, we request you to please stay on stage for a few more minutes, and I now invite His Excellency, Mr. Sanjay Sudhir, to kindly come on stage and, fel and uh, felicitate the guests can also request uh, Mr. Mr. Ramesh Ramakrishnan, Chairman of Transworld Group and Wami Capital, Mr. Nandan Mayer, CEO of Network International, Rahul Arya, and Srimati Damal. On the stage, please. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So just for the, for the benefit of the audience members, the inscription on that crystal memento says a chip of the glass ceiling that you broke, oh, which yeah. we felt was quite apt. <laughs> okay, thank you. And I also request His Excellency Sir to present a memento to our wonderful moderator, Ms. Shobha Mani. Of course. Thank you very much.